Thank you everyone for coming along to our virtual staff room today. This is another one in the series of our 10 things dot dot dot. And we're delighted to welcome my friend and fellow innovator, Dave Leonard from Matthew Moss High School up in the Northwest, um, who's going to share his 10 things. Over to you, Dave, and thanks for coming along. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, just get my slide deck up for you and check that you can see it. Well, I can check that because I've got two devices. That's the just that's the kind of technical wizardry you can expect. Absolutely. From me. Uh, Multitasking. Absolutely. Uh, let me get rid of that nasty message though. We don't want to see that one. Cool. So um, thank you very much for the invite to to come along and to share um, my take on on ten things. I've, I've enjoyed quite a lot of the other. Um, episodes within this series and um, yeah it's 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 got quite personal actually as my presentation I didn't expect it to do so um, I'm not necessarily that reflective in public normally but I think this has been almost a cathartic process going through the the way that I've approached this so a lot of the I would say credit or blame. You can make your own mind up at the end of the presentation. Um, for the way I've approached this, um, goes to goes to Paul because when Paul invited me to do this, he came up with a a list of about six things um, from a perspective of which I could I could offer my thoughts. And and I thought, oh, that one sounds good. Oh, yeah, that one sounds good. Oh, I like, I like that one as well. So so I've taken Paul all of Paul's suggestions um, and I've mixed in a couple of my own. And I'm going to share with you today my reflections on what the last year has meant to me um, from different perspectives. Um, so the, the, the first uh, the first approach I'm going to take is, is from that of, uh, well, before I do that, I can just say this is me and looks a bit like me, uh, just in black and white and slightly grainier and probably a little bit slimmer given what the last 12 months has done to us. Um, and if anybody does watch this back and, and wants to know more about me, um, you can follow me on either at IT Badger on Twitter or at Learning Dust, which is uh, my podcast, which I'll mention later on. So that's the, the inevitable introductions, which is so inevitable, I completely forgot about them. So the first perspective that I'm going to share with you is from the perspective of an educator. And... So this is me and, uh, and and my friend and Paul's friend Zaytoun, who works at Whitton Park over in Blackburn, uh, and that was on again in the days where COVID wasn't stopping us going and seeing people and, and meeting people in face to face. But obviously that all that all had to change, and it changed in many many ways. Um, so my reflection as an educator is is about really the the amazing resilience of human beings from colleagues who were self-confessed technophobes, to learners who overcame tremendous barriers to attend lessons. It was clear to see that there was a hunger and a desire to learn. It's been said by others in this series that there's been some moments of surprise and joy to see the work that some of our learners have undertaken. In our school, we've got one young lady in year eight who decided to make the most of her time by learning Spanish. She's done it so well at this that with the help of a family friend and her MFL teacher, she's hoping to sit a GCSE next year when she's in year nine, so two years early, uh, provided GCSEs are going ahead, of course, next year, which, fingers crossed, they will be, although I'm not sure if I'm a massive fan of uh, standardised testing, but we do need to have some way of, uh, of recognising her, her hard work, I suppose. Um, and we've got other learners who've decided to club together to buy 10, 10 kilograms of air-dried clay between the three of them and teach themselves how to create models with, I have to say, mixed results. Um, even my 10-year-old daughter took it upon herself to work through the um, Google Certified Educator curriculum in order to learn how best to use G Suite or Google Workspace as it's been renamed during, uh, during the pandemic, just to confuse it further. Uh, and she did this, did this just so that she could help her teacher who was struggling a little bit. And I thought that was really sweet of her. And at some point, she might even be persuaded to sit still for long enough to take the three hour exam. And then the next perspective I'm going to look at it is that of, of a techie, of a, a school's technician relating to IT. So speaking of Katie using Google Workspace, uh, I prepared a document last March outlining all of the various courses and tools that were available for staff to develop their skills. When I wrote it, 
I didn't think for a moment that it'd still be beneficial to staff a year later, but it receives regular visits and I still get questions about it to this day. I think necessity is the mother of invention and this being the case, staff have lifted the best baseline skill set when using tech to ensure that they've been able to teach online. Yes, there were schools that were fortunate enough to have schemes in place, which meant that teaching online was a close approximation of what they, used, what they were used to in class, but with people in their pyjamas. But so many schools had to learn a whole new way of working and do it in a short period of time with very, very little guidance from the DFE or from local authorities, I have to say. I had my own frustrations when our, our school leadership team decided to ban the use of Google Meet due to safeguarding concerns. But I recognised that this was just one of hundreds of decisions that they were being asked to make each day. Eventually, with a little persuasion, they realised that not seeing students and being able to check on their well-being was more of a safeguarding concern than a learner being able to see what was on the teacher's bookshelf behind them, or by badger, yeah, as you can see. Now, I'm tremendously proud of what we as a techie community, and I include all you guys in that, have achieved over the last year. And I truly believe that the use of EdTech has advanced significantly faster than it would have done without COVID. So there are some, as I've said, silver linings to come out of this. Excuse me. <coughs> okay. So my next element of my uh, personality is that of a parent. So these are my two daughters, Amy and Katie. Now they've been a source of immense love, amusement, frustration and pride during lockdown. It goes back to my point about resilience really, but neither of them have missed a single online session or failed to submit a piece of work during the past year. And yeah, we're lucky that we've had the space to work in, a reasonable internet connection and enough devices to use. But the way that these two have comported themselves during lockdown has been amazing. As parents, we all feared the impact of missing face-to-face -face education. And some of us struggled to get to grips with mathematical methods that we hadn't used for 30 years. But you know what? Most kids have coped. And this is a great sign that they're in a position to cope in years to come when life throws curveballs at them. Having said all that, I still don't know what a fronted adverbial is. Um, so as a person, this is me uh, in a field with hundreds of other people enjoying each other's company, the sunshine and no doubt a few drinks a couple of years ago. Remember those times when we could come and go in blissful ignorance of just how free we were? This is what I miss, particularly as I look at this image on a grey March afternoon, having just come through a winter of discombobulation. But there's hope, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It might not be this year or even next if the recent comments from our glorious leaders are to be believed. But the fact that I'll soon be grumbling about having nowhere to sit and swatting wasps away from my pint fills me with a strange kind of optimism. As many of you know, and some of you have also experienced, Google offers a certified innovator program that I was lucky enough to be accepted onto in the glorious pre-COVID days of 2019. It was a fabulous experience for many reasons. The chance to see Google HQ, the opportunity to develop a new way of solving problems, <coughs> excuse me, recognition of the hard work that we put into the programme, but most of all, the inheritance of a new tribe. A set of friends who I can genuinely say that without whom I wouldn't be here today, primarily because this is kind of Paul's baby and I met him through that, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, the ability to innovate, to ring the fail bell, to pivot and find new ways of working has been of paramount importance in the last year. And we've all done it, whether we're certified innovators or not. Every single one of us has hit a barrier that's caused us to think differently, to try different ways of working, and hopefully to come out the other side with unexpected solutions. Innovation has been the catalyst to the experiments that we've had to perform. And without it, we wouldn't have the silver linings to the COVID cloud that I'm focusing on today. Speaking of silver linings, the other thing that Paul suggested I could look at it from the perspective of was a beer drinker. Now, I don't know where this reputation has come from. I don't think I've ever mentioned that I like a drink at any point in the past in the virtual staff room. But one of the things that not being able to go out and do anything means, for, for those of us who are still in work anyway, is that we've had to find other ways of spending our disposable income. 
thanks to discussions with Stephen Hope, our good friend, uh, David Price, and a couple of other people who I consider to be thoroughly decent human beings, I decided that if I couldn't go to the pub, I might as well invest in a brewery. So I bought a few shares in BrewDog. This, of course, led me to having to perform my own research into their product, a task which I've approached with gusto and vigour, so much so that dry January is nothing but a hazy memory now. Cheers, guys. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about my life, my second life as a podcaster. Now, it seems that every man and his dog decided that during lockdown was a great time to start a new podcast. Let's face it, it's far easier than writing a book. And the technology available now makes it really easy to get going with. I do maintain, however, that my podcast started before lockdown ensued, which surely allows me to occupy some kind of moral high ground, in the same way that kids think they can be cool by referring to a nightclub as its previous, as its previous name, thus proving that they've been around the scene for ages. As part of my Google Innovator project, I decided that all the conversations I've been having with people in the edtech industry about teachers versus techies will probably be of interest to other folk and so learning dust was born with good advice from the edge of futurists particularly ben whitaker and having enlisted my mate andy as a co-presenter i've really enjoyed chatting with listening to and learning from the guests that have appeared on the podcast it sometimes feel like it feels like a labor of love when you're editing it later late at night but i've met some great people through it and if anyone fancies guesting on a future episode just drop me a line and we'll have a chat. Speaking of labor, labors of love, I've been a governor at my daughter's primary school now for the last decade. It's a role that's grown in scope over that time, but it's one that I think is really important. To support and challenge school leadership sometimes is difficult, never more so than in the last 12 months. School leaders have faced unimaginable challenges during the pandemic and should be applauded for their dedication to the task. This photo is of Catherine Fieber, who was the head at the school at which I'm vice chair of governess and who sadly passed away last month. She was much loved by the staff and children at Broadway and standing up to speak on behalf of governors on the Monday after her death was one of the toughest things that I've ever done. The staff, however, have been amazing and this devastating event has brought the school community closer together than ever before. We'll all miss Catherine but we're working hard to ensure that her legacy is a school that continues her good work. In the days when COVID was just the twinkle in a bat's eye in a cave somewhere in China, the school at which I'd worked for 16 years made the jump to become an academy. Six months later, in the grip of the first lockdown, I attended via Google Meet the most surreal interview process of my life and was appointed as strategic IT director as a result. Taking on a new role during a pandemic was challenging, but I was lucky to have a good team of technicians around me and the unwavering support of my fellow directors, particularly my CEO. There have been challenging times, especially when I told the team that I was restructuring them after the departure of my operations manager. And I've certainly listened to the advice on this postcard, which is upside down intentionally, by the way. Um, but I feel that my team is now well balanced, dedicated and all pulling in the right direction. I've already spoken about the lack of guidance provided to school, school leaders from the DfE and local authorities. And this made the job of leading schools seem very much as though we're feeling our way in the dark. As we emerge into the light of the new abnormal, though, we can be proud of the way in which we've navigated these tricky waters and look forward to the next challenges, knowing that nothing can be as bad as COVID. Well, hopefully, anyway. I wanted to finish by reflecting on my role as a friend and on the importance of friends to us all. This is my mate Derek, who I used to work with 20 years ago and whom I've stayed good friends with ever since. The majority of us are close to someone who suffered at the hands of COVID and unfortunately, Derek succumbed to the disease and passed away in December. You can be sure of a few things with Derek. He was always up for a chat, fiercely loyal for his family, loved a pint and a fag, so much so that some of us believe that Foster's and Marlborough were his only sources of nutrition. He was always, always wearing at least one fleece, as you can see from this photo. 
Um, and he had, strangely enough, uh, Stuart, his son, informed me uh, on the day of his funeral that he'd been buried in this fleece as well because he loved it so much. It's rather macabre, but that's Derek. And he was also the purveyor of some of the worst dad jokes in the history of dads. It's terribly sad that we've lost Derek, but it does make you realise how important friends are, whether you've known them since you were at school, picked them up along the way, or have got to know them later in life. Friends are the family that we have the luxury of being able to choose, and they help us in so many ways, often without even realising it. So I'd like to finish today by saying thanks to all of you, my friends, for playing your part in keeping what little sanity I have left at the end of this year of unprecedented challenges. The virtual staff room has been a place of learning, a place of support, of laughter and of friendship. And for that, I thank you all genuinely. I'll leave you with the last joke that I can remember Derek telling me. So a man walks into a bar with a newt on his shoulder. The bartender said, that's an interesting pet. What's his name? Oh, Tiny, the man replies. What an odd name. Why do you call him Tiny? Ha, ah, because he's minute. And that's Derek all over. And, and that's me. That's my presentation. And that's my, uh, my 10 things reflection on what the last year has meant to me. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dave. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> So I'm I'm with you with a beer. You've got one with you now, have you? <laughs> no, I'm with you. But I mean, you know, you've got. I say I said in the chat, you've got a pie day. Why not a beer day? Every day is a beer day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but yeah, some challenging times when you have some you, you have some big kicks in this last year, and I'm delighted that you're still here with us. But actually, one of the things that that has come through in the messages that you've left there is that actually what has shown us is that some people have got enormous enormous resilience and strength of character you know you exemplified it in your children in the way your team have adapted to your changes in the way the staff at the school have adapted and things so it, it's it's almost you know it's a terrible thing that it's had to come to this but it's actually brought out some enormously strong and thoughtful and kind and generous people hasn't it it's this whole thing so that that is to be celebrated and i get a real sense of that in in the list that you presented with us so no, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to hear paul and, and like i say it was uh it was a strange process to go through writing that i did find it strangely cathartic and uh it was yeah it wasn't what i what i set out um to deliver when i started doing it i thought you know me i like to be uh I like to think that I've got an element of a sense of humour about me and I don't always hit the mark, but I'll, I'll take the piss nine times out of ten. But um, it's, it surprised me what came out as a result of doing that. So it's a good process, good process to uh, to go through and to and to reflect on. And, and I'm now looking forward to the 15th of June. Um, thanks to Caroline's suggestion of it being the of it being National Beer Day. Um, <laughs> National beer. Beer. <laughs> and Jamie, you've bought this beer as well, have you? Because... I don't know. I don't know if I can get on with it or not. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Although my my favourite stuff, uh, Dave, is is the Brewdog stuff. Um, well, this this is this was from Brewdog. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean the um like the original IPA one. Um, yeah. yeah. They're, they're they're original stuff. I I actually think some of their original stuff is their best, to be honest. But, yeah. Uh, I like Elvis Juice. That's one of my favourites. Oh yeah, Caroline likes that one. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, first, I just want to say thanks, Dave, as well. I know I know everybody would thank you in their own way, but um, you are a source of constant inspiration, collaboration and friendship uh, to the whole of the education community. And I think your, you know, your commitment to that is just exemplary. So a massive thank you for that. And I was going to ask you a question, really, which relates to, I mean, your, your presentation just now was brilliant. It was quite emotional as well. So I was sort of quite affected by it as you're going through it, because it made me reflect on the people that um, I've lost and, and also that are ill currently. And um, it really does make it uh, real, doesn't it? You know, um, when people you care about become ill with this, I think it's very easy for us all to see things on the TV. But when you you see it firsthand or experience it firsthand with, with someone that you care about, it's, it's a whole different uh, different thing. But looking forward, um, as we start to emerge out of this strangest of times, I think any of us have probably lived through. I've got a few thoughts on what I think is going to happen, but I'd be really interested in what you think is going to happen with the way we all behave and work with each other, because I think. Firstly, there's going to be a big rush for us all to see each other 
again and just give it, shake each other's hands and share a beer together. You know, I think <laughs> there's going to be a massive desire to do that with so many friends far and wide. So there's going to be a bit of a, a roadshow to do that again, I think, of just meeting people again, just just to meet and to see each other again uh, because it's been mm -hmm. too long. So I think that's, that's one thing. Definitely a few beers. You're right, Paul. Um, and then after that, I think we might start to behave slightly differently because I think we'll probably be, um, somebody said, we will meet with more intent, I think somebody said recently. Um, there'll be more focus, you know, we won't just jump in a car and drive somewhere. We we will still travel, but it'll be with a real, perhaps renewed focus of why we're actually doing that because we've all experienced different ways of working, haven't we? Um, yeah. What's your thoughts on the key things that will change with how we meet and, and interact with each other? Does that feel right to you or do you have a slightly different view? Uh, yeah, I do. I think... I kind of think there'll, there'll be some kind of elasticity about things. I think that, you know, we've stretched in the way that we work at the moment and we'll ping back towards where we were and then we'll kind of do this this bit of settling down. And and I think, is it? I can never remember, is it Boyle's Law or Hook's Law where you take something elastic past its point of no return? I always got those two mixed up. One of them's about gas particles, but it's, as I said in the presentation, it's been 30, 30 years since I've uh, I've needed to know any of that kind of stuff. So uh, so I'm going to forgive myself for, for not getting the right one there. But I think what we'll end up with is, is something that is closer to the way that it used to be originally than it is now. But closer to the way it is now than it was originally if you it's going to be somewhere in the middle that we're going to meet up and i like that idea of of meeting with intent because so much time was was wasted from from everyone's perspective and uh, and you know we used to as at school we used to almost fend off people who wanted to come and meet us just for the sake of meeting us which were glorified sales calls now you know there are different ways of doing that and you guys are good examples of that you know you, you, you're not pushy in in the way that you sell you my, my view is that you sell and you make yourself valuable as a supplier by being yourselves and by offering a service above and beyond what it is you're trying to sell and i'd much rather do business with people like that who who are who are able to to work in partnership with me rather than just extract the money out of me so i think that's the first thing is that not meeting people for the sake of meeting them will be a tremendous relief and when we do actually get together face to face it's it's kind of that thing of you don't know what you've got till it's gone do you and i think we'll value that a lot more than we did beforehand it is hook's law thank you ian and <laughs> <laughs> any and you had your hand up what, what did you want to, to yeah um dave well, um couple of thanks again for the for the presentation it was really um uh, a couple of things uh, from a personal point of view obviously you've had the extra uh challenge of uh, of shielding um sort of over the uh, the last uh, 12 months um and i know that that for for many other uh, people who've had to to do that that's presented lots of different um sort of challenges uh about how you you get things done and manage people and, and whatever else from from home uh, but are there any uh, insights or silver linings uh, from from being forced um, sort of to to spend more uh, more time um, sort of at home? Um, and then uh, from a professional uh, point of uh, view, um, the the whole um, sort of impact of networking. Um, you know, I keep on saying the, the the more I'm able to share, the more I get back. Uh, but not just having one network, having a uh, lot almost like um overlaid uh, petals on a on a leaf something where you've got a network of people who are interested in one thing but then a different network of people and it is sometimes how those networks uh interact so so what it, what uh, benefit have you seen from networks uh, in your own uh, over, over the last 12 months okay um well, I'll start with the first question um, <laughs> relating to shielding. So I, th I think I may have mentioned to, to some of you, I was, I, I was told at the beginning of lockdown that I needed to shield. Um, so my lockdown started a week before everybody else's. Um, so I, I definitely passed the, the year mark. I think, is it tomorrow the anniversary of the official lockdown? Yeah. So I'd, I'd, been, I'd been locked down for a week this time last year um, because, and it's not for anything particularly massive. I, I have a, I used to have a, a, a skin condition called psoriasis, 
and that's been controlled by some medication that actually acts as, a, as an immunosuppressant. So I was told that I needed to shield. So I spent the first eight weeks of lockdown, or first seven weeks plus a week beforehand of lockdown shielding. And then I had a, a consultation with my with my doctor, and she said to me, um, what do you mean you're shielding? Why, why are you shielding? I said, oh, you sent me a letter saying that I had to shield. And she said, oh, yeah, but then um, then the guidance has changed. And uh, you, 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 we should have sent you another one a week after saying that you didn't need to shield after all. <laughs> I said, so I spent the last eight weeks not leave, literally living within a radius of 20 metres, you know, kind of from my, my back garden over there to my front garden over there. 20 metres is perhaps a little bit, you know, maybe 25 metres radius. And, and so I was like, that's crazy. And, and it, it was really... It was a little bit frustrating, but what really frustrated me was if they've messed that up with me, yeah. how many people have they messed it up the other way around who needed to be shielding but weren't doing? So, I mean, the silver lining to me about working from home then were this time last year, we had, we were blessed with some, some lovely weather. So I'd spend a lot of time working in the conservatory or in the garden. Um, and then when I wasn't working, I, I had the, the garden probably by the 1st of April. All my jobs are done normally. I kind of, it's one of those things I have to chip away at throughout the year. And, and, and my, my lovely wife comes in and said, oh, have you thought about maybe painting that fence over there? Uh, yeah, thought about it, but I'm not doing it. Uh, but all that was done by the 1st of April. So so my silver lining really was being able to sit outside in the garden and, and just enjoy it at its, at its best, really. Um, and, and going on to, uh, and incidentally, uh, about a month ago, I received a, I received the second letter that I should have received. <laughs> that was dated the something like the twenty sixth of March, twenty twenty, but it arrived almost. Oh. I think he's frozen out. No, no, I'm back. Are you, yeah, are you, back. Yeah. yeah, you know what I was saying earlier about having a good internet connection. It does still have its moments, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, fair, play to, fair play to the NHS. They made good on the promise and did send me the letter telling me that I no longer needed to shield. Um, in terms of that professional networking idea, um, I think you're absolutely right. And I think I spoke, um, one of my friends from university got in touch with me, probably, probably around about July, August time, probably July, I think it was, last year, and said, I'm, I'm in discussion with, uh, with an author and he's, he's got this, this strange concept for a book where he just interviews random people and puts their words down verbatim and it forms this book and he looks into the patterns of of what's been said. And he said, are you up for it? It's like you know, half an hour's interview. I said, yeah, go on. Not, not like we can do anything else, is it? Yeah. And, and as part of that, he so he, he told me about this book and he, he, gave me the, um, he gave me the concept of it and he said, I've got a number of of questions that I have. I think, I can't remember how many, it's something like 25 standard questions. He said, so um, pick a number and I'll ask you that question and and then I'll just ask you to talk about that question. Um, oh, you met him, have you, Jamie? Yeah, it's... it's it yeah, is. I did. Yeah, yeah. He he asked me the hardest question ever. He, he said, uh, describe something that you believe to be true but which you cannot prove. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> tough one <laughs> yeah I mean and I think having heard that one I think a lot of his questions it prob I'd say they're probably provocations rather than than questions um they're probably coming from that same kind of he must have bought you know the little book of philosophy or something like that <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> course, but um mine was mine was three words my question my question was who are you and then I had to talk for 20, 20 minutes, half an hour about those three words. And and I just started wittering on, um, as, as I'm prone to do. And and over t after a little bit, I kind of struck on this idea and said, well, what do you mean? Who am I? Who am I as a, as a dad? Who am I as a friend? Who am I as a husband? Who am I as a professional? Who am I as all these different things, because we all have different hats. And, and it reminded me of, the, of that conversation when I was writing today's presentation that I said to him at the time, I, I kind of see us as, as, as like um, 
we're just one big Venn diagram and we've all got these different intersecting elements of our of our personality. And I think what you were saying there, Ian, about the layers of, of our kind of networks, how they overlap as well. There's something to be said about about that as well. And that there, there are common threads and there's probably certain people who you will include in a number of your layers of networking who are common all the way through there. And, um, and I think it's interesting that you're right, we learn something and we take something from each one of those layers, don't yeah. we? And I know, Ian, you're very much aware of, of this, but for those on the call who may not be, we, we had a, we've had we got a project running at work which somebody contacted me and said, do you know anything about virtual reality? Or it might be a good idea to get this into th this this model. We were given a historical model of the of the area in which we work. And they said it might be a good idea to get this into into virtual reality and i said no i know very little about virtual reality but i know someone who does um and i called called on ian for his support and his help and he very generously gave up a significant amount of his time and brought in other people with also they had expertise in it and i think that power of networking is tremendous and, and going back to what jamie was saying those meetings that we have, they don't necessarily have to be in person to be to be meaningful. And they don't necessarily have to be meaningful at the time. You know, the number of conversations that Ian and I have had before that moment about all manner of things, one of which included virtual reality. That's what networking is, isn't it? It's building up your your list of contacts, your list of friends, so that when you need something, you've got somebody to call upon who you don't need to know everything. I've always said that in certainly in as, as a techie working in IT, you are a jack of all working in education, you were a jack of all trades and and a master of none. And it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I think that yeah. that's probably going back to I think I may have answered your question there, Ian. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, no, no, Dave. You you definitely have. And I just think that um um it's a skill that I that I wish I'd learnt uh, earlier in life. Uh, but but maybe um, sort of going through school and uh, and university and, and whatever else, um, I didn't have uh, the the telecommunications networks. You know, the the all all the things that we take for granted now aren't, weren't there. So so you know, growing up in uh, in, in sort of Barrow and Furness, then obviously you, you, your world was your family, your friends, and and the, and the people that you went to school with or worked or, or whatever else. And if you had a problem. You could share it, but you could only share it with those people. Um, and actually, you could only share it with them when you saw them because um, there, were, there wasn't another, you know, I couldn't say, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll just put that on Facebook in 1972. Oh, no, there's no Facebook. What's going on in the world? Um, but, I, but I think the, um, the challenge for us is obviously, you know, I've got a grandson uh, who's eight years old, and I hope that, that by talking to him and, and encourage him to build his own networks the earlier you build those and the more diverse you build those it's good but then with the people you brought on at work dave uh you know uh your uh, team saying to them that, that obviously they can solve problems amongst themselves but they can also solve problems better by building their networks and reaching out so i think it's it's a good thing that we can do for everybody uh, i'll pass it back to jamie yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ian. It, it was really just picking up on the networks uh, conversation, really, because I was I was delivering a presentation to students at Burnley College last week, and a substantial amount of that presentation was about the very point you're making, Dave, about the power of networks and being able to call on friends, because I think often that's something that maybe careers advisors in schools and colleges don't always um, focus on as much as perhaps they should. So one of my slides, for example, was a, a slide of LinkedIn, and it showed sort of the connective power, if you like, of, of being connected to people through LinkedIn and seeking out people uh, on platforms like LinkedIn who might be of uh, value to you in the future uh, and may be able to open doors for you. And if you approach those people in the right way and build that relationship in the right way, they can become powerful advocates that can be quite transformational for you in the future. And they were quite shocked when we were talking about jobs as well, because they... Um, Many of the students I was speaking to perhaps um, had a certain view of uh, how to go about applying for jobs. And I was pointing out that there's more jobs on LinkedIn today than there is anywhere else you'll find. I mean, last week, I think it was 20 million jobs globally available on LinkedIn <laughs> on any given day. So if you can't find an opportunity in that, then <laughs> um, but, but if you're not coached and given the right coaching, and I, I do think 
um, I'm becoming just more and more convinced as as we go on this journey <laughs> where we are you know, at the moment that coaching is, is just is just like an essential thing now. I think in life, I think everybody needs a coach. No matter no matter what what you are, whether you're the executive chairman of a company or whether you are a student, not even leaving school or college yet, I think everybody needs a coach um, because <clears throat> it's such a, a critical thing. I think in terms of uh, personal and professional development and. I think um, maybe that's what a lot of students need, you know, just, just a little bit of coaching, just to be nudged in the right direction to where some of these opportunities are. Yeah, it's something that we've done a lot of at, at our place. We've we set it up, gosh, three years ago now, I think it was, um, so that each year 11, um, it wasn't each year 11, it was any year 11s that were identified as underperforming. Now, that was not necessarily based on on like progress eight data it was just you know the, if you were a teacher or, or you knew a year 11 who you thought Do you know what this guy this girl should be doing a lot better than they are doing and they're they're at risk of of not hitting what they need to do to get what they're capable of out of their education um they they were put um they were put on on a scheme where they were partnered up with a member of staff and this was a member of staff from any area of the of, of the organization so there were teaching staff there were non-teaching staff there were teaching assistants there were office staff everybody was invited to to become a coach for for a year 11 and it was pretty i have to say it was predominantly year 11 boys um because they're the ones who tend to to waste their opportunities a little bit more and and aren't necessarily as mature as, as the girls to see what it means um but it was it was massively impactful um so so that's that's worked really really well and and so many of those young people took the advice many of them didn't don't get me wrong but so many of them took that that advice that was offered and, and acted upon it and and as a result they they probably came out with better results than they would have done the other thing that we do is is a peer coaching scheme and that's something that i've been involved in in leading at school uh, myself and, and one of the teachers steph um and that's based upon a lot of the things that that we learn as a school so um transactional transactional analysis comes right into the bottom of it which is uh, something that eric burner psychologist from i think he used to work with the army in the 50s started up uh, and we do a lot of work with a, a guy called giles barrow who um, takes that and puts it into the educational perspective and and he's helped us to develop this program of peer coaching where we we offer that coaching to to colleagues to staff where anybody can approach those of us who've kind of been trained up to be peer coaches and just say can i get an hour of your time uh and we gladly give it up and and as much as anything else what certainly what i gain from it when i'm coached and and also and i also gain a lot when i'm coaching i have to say of this is is just having that quiet hour to focus on 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 yourself when you're being coached um and, and i've had some coaching myself where i've just turned up and I've, I've had this hour booked and i've no idea what i wanted to talk about but by the end of the hour you learn something about yourself and it's always always beneficial yeah it's, it's very <clears throat> it's very powerful isn't it that dave yeah. um I, I in my own way um i'm doing a, a course at the moment um a, a university course and it, that's my sort of hour that you just described really like when i'm in that hour of a lecture or whatever and i'm really reflecting on my own uh, my own uh, business and what we do and, and our practice in c learning and other things it is a, it is a, both a luxury because it's now out of if you like running businesses and things um but it's also tremendously valuable isn't it that self-reflection and reflecting on how you work and why you do what you do um i, I think it's it's priceless really that is yeah definitely and that it's so rare isn't it to get an hour to focus on anything let alone to focus on yourself so uh, so yeah i do i do really value it i think it's a great program yeah so so dave uh paul jamie everybody can i just uh share a question um that i got from uh, simon wainwright he's uh dave he's uh, one of these enterprise uh coordinators down in the southwest he used to be uh the sort of uh, schools sort of it advisor uh, for uh, for all the schools in Plymouth and uh, and surrounding areas, um, Simon's chatting to me in the morning, and then I think either tomorrow afternoon or Wednesday he's talking at some um, sort of conference 
um, in the uh, in the southwest about uh, tech and students and all the rest of it. And the, and the question was around VR. So just going back uh, sort of full circle. Uh, but what he was saying was, um, how is the, the, the VR sector or what, whatever it is, the market, promoted in schools in terms of careers, um, available careers and related skills? Um, so, you know, is there other people um, sufficiently, I, I guess, how is careers advice given to students these days? Um, and when they're, when they're talking to them, <clears throat> do they actually say, oh, by the way, um, as I as I had the privilege um, on Sunday night to listen to watch um, Rosie Summers uh, do an hour's worth of uh, VR uh, performance art performance. I mean, it was absolutely awesome. Uh, but you know, if there's a a lady, a, a student uh, in uh, your school, would would somebody be saying, you know what, you could be a performing VR artist, and then uh, you could create some original art and using uh, what do they call them, uh, Jamie? Those um, um, blockchain token things that uh, <laughs> dirigible or forigible things. Uh, you, you can. You, people are now trading um, art, digital art, uh, through blockchain yeah. technology. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and uh, sort of. So so I mean, is VR uh, careers advice uh, something that's given now uh, in schools, Dave? Do you know? I'm certainly not aware of any schools that are doing it using VR. Um, maybe you know, using sort of digital platforms, that's definitely happening. Uh, you know, Google Meet, Zoom, Teams, that kind of thing. I've not come across anybody using VR, but as I said earlier, I'm, I'm very new. And I would, if, if anyone other than you had asked me that question, Ian, I probably would have folded onto you to try and <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it, It's okay, because I, I think the, that it's always good you know it's like a um, um market survey of one isn't it um yeah. and what we're trying to say is um there are so many amazing uh careers um there are so so many um amazing um business opportunities uh both businesses creating new uh sort of virtual reality spaces or uh, people creating new products and applications and uh, all, all these different skill skill sets. Uh, uh, if, if the businesses aren't talking to the schools to say these are the skills and competencies that we're looking for, then um, the students themselves don't think, oh, yeah, I'm good at mm. problem solving or whatever I, it I is. suspect you're most likely to find it at the moment in organisations that have already taken a very progressive approach to industries such as esports. So, for example, I mean, esports, um, for those people who don't know much about the industry, they always seem to be shocked at the size and scale of the industry because, for example, it's larger than all American sports put together now in terms of billions of dollars of value. It's larger than baseball, American football, and the whole lot, basketball, all put together. Esports generates more revenue and is larger than all those things put together. Um, so it's truly mind-bogglingly large and exciting and there are some colleges and universities in the uk that are gr grasping that and uh, and the careers those young people are going to have are just going to be phenomenal because there is so much money in that industry it's unbelievable it's awash with money yeah and, and of course vr is starting to head into that it is part of the gaming industry and everything else and i think that when vr becomes part of more of the the core of uh, esports which is inevitable i would suggest because um the immersive potential and you know you imagine being in a competitive call of duty game but with a vr headset on where you may as well be in that environment for real well well who wouldn't want to be you know that's going to be a very fascinating experience isn't it for millions of human beings so that's going to take it to another level now those people preparing young people for that industry which is not even that far off because you could almost say it's now yeah. um, it, it isn't even a future thing it's happening now i think that is uh where we might see some elements of that, but but at the moment it's probably not the mainstream, whereas perhaps it should be. Yeah, and I, and I understand, uh, Jimmy, from the gaming world uh, about that, but I think what we're starting to see is um, this um, uh, huge transformation in the way, for example, we talk about office space, uh, but uh, and then you talk about WeWorks and you talk about uh, Regis and all these other companies. Um, I'm I'm seeing already. Uh, lots of evidence of people create and and these are new companies 
um, creating Updave uh, on Somnium or Engage or, or wherever it is, creating new virtual offices. Um, and suddenly the people who were the physical office people uh, could could well uh, get uh, sort of a short change quite quickly as people say, you know what, I'll, uh, I'll just buy one of these virtual offices, but I won't buy it from somebody else. And I think the opportunity, uh, which is the, probably the final point, is for young people coming from schools who've got the skills out of gaming or whatever else, they could very quickly go on and start to create their own businesses offering virtual uh, office facilities and maybe just locally dave in the in the in the place where uh, where they live uh, but uh, but who knows uh, beyond that so uh, thanks thanks for that i wonder whether there's a there's a bigger question isn't there about at what point does a careers kind of curriculum make the jump to seeing that particular thing as a potential um, route for work or an employment so being a YouTuber just simply didn't exist even just 10 years ago, whereas there are people making millions out of it, even just being an influencer, a social media influencer. These are people who are famous for doing just that. And without that influencing role, they ha don't have a kind of a profession or a skill base necessarily other than that skill base. And it's, it's a at what point does that careers advisor say, oh, yeah, that's a proper job. Yeah, that's a proper job. And that's it's a fascinating, isn't it? And I think there's a there's a kind of a time lag, isn't there? And I'm thinking back, and I know that you probably joke that my careers advisor could give you careers advice if you wanted to be an engineer. Hmm. Now, you can't anyone, no one on this call, however little or much you know me, you couldn't ever imagine me as an engineer. You know, I was I was yeah. rushing to look. For, I, I was the first person in my family to have a makeup kit. You know, so <laughs> there's, no, there's no way I was going to be an engineer. So it's, it's, uh, it's about at what point does that careers curriculum say you've got to consider this and offer these opportunities to make students aware that this that yeah. is an acceptable route i mean the that very concept happens, the very concept of a career though is <clears throat> is itself being disrupted as well isn't it paul yeah. because you've heard this phrase of the rise of the slashy yeah because i'm a teacher slash engineer slash uh tobogganist slash adventurer you know whatever um so we, we're seeing people with portfolio careers now because unless you're going to be something very specific like i'm going to be a vet or whatever the the concept of a career itself has been disrupted as well and um for example there are many businesses now quite large ones and quite internationally known ones that encourage their people to spend 20 percent of their time or whatever on a side hustle doing something else yeah <clears throat> because this is how life is now and it actually enriches um the overall experience so uh yeah even the concept of a career is being disrupted now absolutely where do you feel you're at with all this johnny what's your career's advice to your children Ooh, uh i don't know well i mean i'm glad you mentioned that i jumped into the conversation round about you lot talking about networks and the importance and dave talking about the importance of coaching and all that kind of stuff and as you know paul but the others don't i was having a bit of a rant in our house here last week because one of our kids was accused of a serious fraud at school and uh, i ranted on linkedin in a one minute um okay. a one minute article which i've thrown in the chat for you all to have a look at me quick rant um but yeah i really want to teach the kids about the importance of using the power of connectivity i mean connecting to people to forge their paths in whatever directions those take and uh, to stop thinking about single single routes think about many routes and all sorts of ways of getting there yeah, and i'll let you read that no thank you yeah i mean it's fascinating my daughter um who i'm sure you all know because i mentioned it endlessly um works in theater but of course she's got no work at the minute so in her downtime she's um darren can come in can't hear a bit like that oh did someone let him in Apologies, um, I, I, apologies. I tried to let him in and hit the wrong button there, Paul. That was oh, my no. fault. So I'll reach out to him later and let him know. <laughs> okay. I'll let him know. I'll, I'll take the blame. It's fine. Um, but she's set up an Etsy shop. Um, and actually, she's the the just watching that grow. I'm thinking about when I started my own business 12, 13 years ago as an education consultant when I left local authorities, compared to how she's built hers. Hers is entirely online. You know, she's an enormously experienced and and thoughtful hashtag. And researcher 
and thinks about that and it's i think it's it's how she builds it and they've just done a kind of a, a kind of profile raising exercise with six other companies this weekend that's been entirely online and they spent days preparing reels and things rather than you know an advertising campaign or you know a, a mail shot or it's just everything's kind of changed and it's a it's a fascinating and how again it's back to that thing about how does the career officer get their head round there's almost like too much now there's like you say there's no clear defined path for a career and i remember reading literally probably 20 years ago that the expectation is that someone might have anything up to seven separate careers in their working life that's not seven separate jobs that's seven separate career sectors you know industry sectors in a working life and heaven only knows what it would be now if it was seven many years ago so it's a it's almost the most fluid thing of the whole thing isn't it that whole thing about employment and what it is and how it functions yeah i think there's also a need for much greater focus on entrepreneurship as well paul um because if you just look at how industries and sectors are changing i mean especially even the public sector so for example there are certain parts of the west midlands and, uh, where i live where up until not long ago over 40 percent of all of the employment was the public sector but due to changes that have gone on in the public sector those that 40 percent is not even close to that figure anymore and so there's got to be generation of other opportunities now that won't just come from incumbent providers of jobs because they are, they're having their own challenges. So the only solution to fill the gap, if you think about it logically, will be to for people to be empowered to create their own jobs and do their own things. And I think entrepreneurship should be part of the curriculum personally, along with digital skills. I think those two, two skills are now as essential as literacy and numeracy. In fact, there was a report on the BBC just today saying that the UK has a crisis in terms of digital skills, and it does. And the slightly frustrating thing for me is that if you've been around the block as long as I have, you may recall a 2013 paper from the Science and Technology Committee of the Government of the Day, 2013, called the Digital Skills Crisis in the UK. That was, that was you know, eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's not not news is it <laughs> or at least it shouldn't be so it makes you wonder why respective governments have not addressed it because they're running out of time they're running out of road with it no absolutely yeah it's, it's going to be in, interesting to see how that one gets addressed isn't it um because actually the schools have moved away from digital i mean what used to be ict to computing because that was the route we chose um and that that end user skill set that the majority of people are going to use we don't need the number of coders that you know go suggested we need when he wrote that new curriculum really we needed some there was a skills gap in that industry sector but not anything like the number that he suggested and they would have all have been filled by now yeah i think yeah i think so, sorry dave i i'll, I'll um, let, let you speak dave i was only going to say that i think the focus on coding was perhaps short-sighted because very quickly we'll head into a time when um you know you'll be able to use ai to write your own code effectively very quickly yeah yeah and that, and that came at the expense of lots of the digital skills that we're talking about so because they had to put um coding into the curriculum then something that something had to give way so what we're talking about is a lack of digital literacy a lack of digital wisdom a lack of the basics in skills because staff then were forced to jump into teaching coding and they weren't teaching things like organizing your files so and now as a result you ask a kid where they've saved something and it's like i don't know so they're missing all those things that it used to be you know lesson number one of it in year seven was this is how you log on this is how you create a file this is how you organize it and, and put it in a folder and that all got blown out to the window because all of a sudden we had to be installing Python and getting kids using Scratch instead. Yeah. I remember being furious, being told that I had to change my design lessons to, you know, to just do a coding curriculum. It's like, what? That's got nothing to do with design. And there's not going to be this thing in the future where you have the equivalent of typing pools full of you know, kids bashing away writing lines of code. Because as Jamie said, There'll be an AI to write that and some, you know, uber nerd making the whole, orchestrating the whole thing from his bedroom. Yeah, completely. I think that's the way it's going to go. Uh, that, that's why I didn't sort of encourage my kids to perhaps learn coding in the way that I did when I first got a computer in my hands and stuff. And you had to know how to code it to get it to do anything useful. Um, where we're going now is the intelligent uh, time is spent 
you know, building the, the there's going to be apps. In fact, I've already seen some initial work on this where you'll just tell the app what kind of an app you want building and it does it for you. <laughs> so so it's a, it's a bit like I've always been a little bit reserved and it might be a little bit of a controversial point, but I've always been a little bit reserved about how much time I'd want to spend learning a foreign language when I can already talk to translation artificial intelligence that does it all for me. Do I need to spend 20 years learning Mandarin or do I need to just have the right technology? You know, I think my kids are going to see the version of uh, the Babel fish become real, you know, where they can just, uh, you know. Absolutely. And any maths over the age of 12. So pretty much given that you can scrap most of maths, get rid of coding and typing, and the other languages, well, there's a big hole in your curriculum. Now let's start talking about entrepreneurship uh, and global crises. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I do think that for, for um, work purposes, to be able to do what you're suggesting, Jamie, is great. But for personal reasons, to be able to speak to someone in their native language, that's a joy. And, and I, you know, I speak the tiniest, tiniest bit of Italian. Please don't speak Italian to me, Darian, Darren, if you know it, because you'll really very quickly realize how little I know. I wouldn't starve and that'd be about it. But the little bit I do speak, I find a joyful experience. The mental challenge I really enjoy, that connection in their native tongue I also enjoy. Um, and yeah. so I would worry that we went completely to machines. And I don't want Darren to be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, but, but um, we're, we're at one o'clock now, and um, um, I know you've only just arrived, Alan. I'm delighted you're here, but I am going to round up if that's all right, and I, I'm going to share a story. Um, I was listening to a futurist about two years ago. He was talking about appless mobile phones. So you basically turn on the mobile phone, and it asks you a series of questions. It says, "What do you like to do?" He says, "I like Facebook, I like Instagram, I like TikTok, or whatever it happens to be." He says, "Okay, good," and then it loads those and builds a personalized app bespoke to that mobile phone for your personal use because of the, the preferences you've stated but then over time if you suddenly start to find yourself following links to grinder or whatever then it'll say oh by the way did you know that you're you're nipping over to the grinder app you want to build that in now and it'll 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 read and personalize based on your usage of the device so it won't be install all the apps you need it'll be just turn it on and it'll prompt you and monitor and make suggestions and grow and build itself into the single app that you might want which is kind of what you're saying that ai will build that uh, yeah. for you. fascinating point you're making there paul now i won't take up too much more time because i know we're over time anyway but that very point you're making just now is something i was studying on my course last week because the professor at cambridge was talking about if you buy, for example, the latest £1,000 or whatever iPhone, um, one of the reasons for the cost is a whole range of additional functionality and features built into it that you will be very unlikely to ever use. But you are paying for it when you buy the device. So for those people who want to be disruptive, I would suggest perhaps it's a smart strategy to streamline and strip out all the nonsense we pay for that we don't need and actually deliver a service which is exactly just the thing that people actually need. And it's amazing how many products and services don't do that. They actually add all this other stuff that you don't need and then charge you for it. Absolutely. So, David, thank you very much. David, I've never called you David before. Dave, thank you very much. I mean, I mean, your mum calls you David, don't you? Yeah, that was, that was very formal. That's, thank you, Mr. Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Leonard. It's been me, David. <laughs> Too bad. Yeah, your mum does when she's telling you off. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm so, always in trouble when Caroline calls me Jamie. Uh, <laughs> what, she, what, Caroline speaks to you. <laughs> Occasionally, so, yeah. So, Dave, thank you very much for your time today. That was excellent. It will be on <laughs> our YouTube channel um, yeah. as before. Once we've got it ourselves sorted, to actually get around to posting some of these things up. Oh, that's my job. Still haven't done it, but I will get them up there, hopefully over Easter. Um, and you can enjoy the whole thing if you didn't manage to get it all. Thank you very much for coming along, everyone. Yeah. Have an excellent rest of the day, and I will see you all soon. <laughs>